You're listening to the Trinity Podcast. We are a multi-site church in the Chicago area whose mission is to help you look, live, and love more like Jesus. Welcome back to the Trinity Podcast. These are our midweek episodes where we get to talk about some of the things that we don't get to talk about on the weekend. And we are right in the middle of a series called Walking with the King, where we're looking at Mark's gospel, really from now all the way up until Easter. So uh, obviously we're not going to be able to cover the entire gospel. So during these midweek episodes, we're going to be looking at portions of Mark go- Mark's gospel that we don't get to talk about on Sunday. So uh, here with me in the studio is Pastor Paul. He's our site pastor from our Kimberly Way location. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Great to be, uh, great to be here. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, uh, happy to have you. We're going to take a look actually today at Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 39. Um, we kind of kicked off the whole series on Ash Wednesday, looking at kind of the introduction to the story. Um, but here we start to get some snapshots of the kingdom mm. as we see Jesus in action. So it really starts, this portion starts with Jesus is returning to Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Mm. And then we get kind of the remainder of the chapter. Mm. Um, So as we take a look at really verses 16 to 39, um, Paul, I would love to know what jumps out at you as you look at kind of some of the first things, first recorded things that we see Jesus doing. Yeah, well, and we've already covered this um, some in staff and yeah, with church and different studies, but I'm really just appreciating now how in verses 14 and 15, like those are the first words recorded of Jesus, already getting to business, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God's at hand. And then right away, he starts calling some people to, to come with him. And I think that's really significant right there. Like his first big act kind of as the, the new king on the scene is that he's calling some people to, to follow him, to join him. Uh, And I think the more you learn about the context and what's going on here, like the people that he calls are surprising. Uh, That he goes to the sea, to some fishermen, and calls them to to join him and follow him. And we've talked a little bit about this before, but uh, uh, could you speak to like, what about these uh, guys that Jesus calls? Like, why is it surprising that he would call them and maybe not others? Yeah. Yeah, we did talk about that a little bit uh, kind of in our staff meetings. Um, I think it's because in many ways we're like really familiar with the story. If you've been raised in church, it's like, oh, yeah, of course he calls these guys. But it would not have been, in a, of course, like yeah. in the first century um, because of the fact that uh, if they are working with their father, if they're participating in the family trade, um, it's because they didn't make it in basically Sunday school. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, everybody in, you know, if you were a, a pious, you know, Jewish young man, a boy really at that time, you would have been received some early education in like the Torah. You would have received some early education in the scriptures and you would have been kind of evaluated. And uh, if you didn't learn enough or weren't a good enough student or the rabbi didn't think you had potential, he would tell you in the politest way that he could, uh, you should return and to your home and do your father's trade. Yeah. So yeah, further study is not for you. No, it's, uh, further study is not yeah. for you. You flunked out. Yep. So go back and, and learn your father's trade. Yes. And I, I, I think about like the equivalent today of these are the guys that maybe they passed high school, but they couldn't get much farther than that. You know, and Jesus, these are the people that Jesus wanted to come and, and be with him. And right when Jesus makes the invitation, they, they follow him. And so I think, I mean, there's so much to put together there, but I do love how Jesus right away sets this uh, approach where he's not going to be doing this alone, even though maybe he could have, mm-hmm. like he could have very well done alone, but he, he didn't want to. And that was one of his first things that he did. So I think that's really important for us as Christians. If we ever feel like we are going about our, our faith or life alone, um, we should know that when it comes to being a part of uh, the church and like being a believer, you really aren't supposed to do it alone. Like you need to have other people with you just like Jesus did. Yeah. I think the other thing that's encouraging about it, too, is I do think that there are times when Jesus calls us to join him on his mission. Mm. You know, he calls us to be his witnesses. And I think oftentimes um, we feel like we're not adequate to the task. Yeah. You know, I don't I don't know enough. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know enough theology. I'm not that well versed in the Bible. You know, I'm just an I'm just an every, everyday average person. Mm. But that's who he calls. He calls everyday average people yeah. um, to follow him and to, w- and to walk with him and to work with him. And so I actually take a lot of comfort 
in the fact that these are the people that he calls. Mm. He doesn't go and call the religious experts. He doesn't go and call the most theologically astute. Um, he calls everyday people. Yeah. And um, something that actually um, uh, another person on our team, mm. uh, Pastor Roy, mm. said is he said, I find it significant that Jesus calls us to follow him into our lives, mm. which I just thought was yes. such an interesting I, yeah. way to say that. Wow. Yes, it is. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, Jesus wants to then just be seen the, the places that they go. And we read a little bit later of <clears throat> Jesus meeting Peter's mother-in-law and, of course, you know, healing her, too. And, uh, so yeah, the fact that as Jesus becomes a part of their lives, like he really is a part of their lives. Mm-hmm. And that's, that, that is really significant. Yeah, it's funny as you talk about Peter, kind of be just an ordinary person, the people that are called. Uh, thinking about that passage from like Acts chapter four, I think. So this is like, I mean, after everything from the Gospels has already taken place, and when some some outsiders or some people who are I maybe mean, religious leaders, they look at Peter, and I think it was James and John, they could still tell that they're ordinary, sort of unschooled guys, but they could yeah. tell that they had spent time with Jesus. And so it's funny that like throughout all this time with Jesus, they, they kind of remain the same in many ways. Like they were just who they were. And yet they were people who, I mean, their, all, all their lives were, were changed by Jesus. Um, yeah. And I think that is how it says it, right? It says yeah. they could tell that they were ordinary <laughs> unschooled fishermen, but that they'd been with Jesus. Been with Jesus. So still the same, but also different. Yeah. Something changed Something in them, changed. but they still were yeah. everyday people. They weren't, <laughs> they weren't, they weren't top scholars no. now. They were still just the ordinary people. Yeah. I'm glad you highlighted that. Cause I, I, yeah, I wouldn't have made that con- connection right off the bat, but that is something that just continues to be a theme in mm. their lives and as they walk with him. So just really very, very cool Yeah, um, to see that that's who he, that's who he selects. Mm. Those are his first, first disciples. I also love though, just the redefinition of their calling. Mm. They're fishermen. And then he says, I want you to become fishers of men. Yeah. I've always loved that word mm. play. Yeah. Um, yeah. In some ways he really is leaning on the gifts and the skills that they have, but in a totally different way. And it does make me wonder like what, what were the things that he desired, that he saw in them that he desired to redeem and cultivate and, and shape and change. And I think we, we get hints of it as we watch their story, but it never explicitly says. No. He just, he just picks them and mm. says, you come with me. So, yeah. So what else do we, do kind of jumps out at you? I mean, as we're just looking, this, is, this isn't this is even a full chapter. Right. They, There's so much packed in. There's so much packed in. And that's really Mark's style. Mm. Mark is very fast paced. He's Jesus is moving from one place to another to another. What are some other things that really jump out at you as we're looking at just this small chunk of text? Yeah. Well, the next kind of story, verses 21 to 28, where Jesus is in the, the synagogue teaching, and then he gets interrupted by this man who's possessed by an evil spirit. And then the, really the dialogue that goes on between the man and Jesus is really interesting. Again, this would be like surprising. Uh, it was to me, I remember reading it for the first time, because the man says, what would you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth, kind of using that us language as, you know, we demons here. Uh, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And so it's interesting how this man and this unclean spirit really speaking is speaking truly about Jesus in a way like these unclean unclean spirits recognize that Jesus is the Holy One of God, maybe more perceptive than all the rest of the people. You know, they know Jesus is special. Well, like he's really articulating who Jesus is, the Holy One. But then Jesus rebukes him, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's like he's speaking the truth, but Jesus rebukes him and says, you know, be silent and come out of him. And, you know, again, I think that you read that episode, you're like, wow, why does he want him to be be silent, like what's going on here. But again, what that whole episode tells me is like Jesus, he does ultimately have control uh, and power even over these dark demonic forces. And he, even with his own ministry and revealing who he is, he wants to have control over that as well. And he does. Uh, so I, I think that there's really a show of, of power here and that the real, the real enemies that Jesus is coming to, to fight are these demonic forces. So you learn a lot about Jesus, um, kind of what he's coming to do and the power that he has right there. Yeah. And we see that this actually happens a couple of times, not just with the demons, but even with, you know, people he interacts with, Mm. you know, um, we'll see a little later on, there's an incident where he heals a person and actually tells him, Hey, don't tell people, Mm -hmm. you know, just go do this. And then he goes and tells them anyways. (laughs) But there's this, there is this theme in Mark of kind of the messianic secret where it almost seems like Jesus initially doesn't want people knowing yeah. that he's the Messiah, doesn't want them knowing that he's the son of God. 
And one of the things that kind of puzzles us about that, you know, at first we're like, well, why, why wouldn't you want them to know? Right. But the more you begin to see how the people thought about what it meant to be the Messiah and the Savior was very different from what Jesus hmm. came to bring. Yeah. And so in many ways, he's almost telling them, like, I want to define what it means for me to be king, what it means for me to be Messiah on my terms, mm. not yours. Mm. And so there is kind of this, uh, this tension in Mark. Um, but uh, I also think that's the beauty of the narrative in many ways. Mark lets the words and the actions of Jesus do the talking. Yeah. Not necessarily what people say about him. Mm. And so it's an invitation, I think, to see Jesus for who he is through what he does and through what he says. Yeah. Rather than kind of putting our own filter on top. Mm. Yep. Um, but that's why I love this book is because it really is saying you need to look at Jesus for who he is, not who you want him to be. Yeah. And I... I'm, I'm so glad that we're covering the gospel and how we cover the gospels, I think, often here at Trinity. I mean, no matter whether you've been a believer your whole life or you're new to it, like you, you kind of always need to be seeing Jesus kind of with a fresh perspective and going way back to, okay, what did, what did he actually say? What did he do? And let's make sure we're really paying attention to him because it's so easy to lose sight of that or our own ideas sort of get layered in or, or kind of cloud who Jesus really is. And so the fact that we're we're coming back really just paying attention um, to what, what Jesus says, what he does. Uh, it was helpful for them, but it's helpful for us. We need that. Yeah. What do you think are some of the, maybe the popular misconceptions of Jesus that kind of get debunked as we look at a narrative like Mark's? Mm. The misconceptions they might've had or the ones that oh, we would have? Us today. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking, I, I'm thinking more us today. Yeah. Well, I think one misconception would be if Jesus was there to uh, really sort of overthrow or like challenge the 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 human authorities with the with the intent to like overthrow them or start an insurrection or something like he was really trying to have sort of a political aim here and Jesus does say that he has a kingdom so I mean and he is a king of course but it's again not quite the thing of he's not just trying to um, challenge the established powers that's not the only thing he's doing he will inevitably do that just by the fact of claiming to be a king, but the king above all kings. Um, but here he's again showing that instead of the, the human forces that he's trying to challenge, he's really challenging, uh, especially the, the demonic and the, the dark forces, you know, those powers and authorities. Um, and I don't think we always appreciate um, that aspect of, of Jesus' ministry. At least, I mean, that's one misconception, I think, that, that we can have. We, we forget that whole, the spiritual... Uh, war that Jesus ultimately won uh, and fought. Yeah, I think another one too that really comes out in Mark's you know narrative is sometimes we get this idea that Jesus is just a good spiritual teacher. He's mm. here to give us some some laws and some rules that will make our lives better. It's really not about him. You know, it's about more this kind of self improvement right. program. And one of the things I find over and over again in in Mark, especially, is uh, in some ways, and you have to be careful how you say this, but mm. in some ways it's He's, there's a very egocentric nature to Jesus, not in a prideful, arrogant, and unwarranted way. Right. But one of the things that he does highlight over and over again is like, it is about him. Yeah. It is his kingdom. I'm the one God sent. I'm yeah. the one that he sent. You need to know me. Mm -hmm. You need to understand what I'm here to do. Yeah. Um, and so on the one hand, you have this incredible egocentricity, but mm. also this incredible other orientedness, mm. you know, to him. And in any other person, uh, you get one or the other of those things. Yeah, um, I think I, I think it was a sermon I heard by Tim Keller, and I don't know if he was quoting somebody else or not, mm. but he talked about how there's just this strange co combination of uh, it's a, really a paradox in Jesus. He's like when you look at some of the greatest megalomaniacs, mm. you know, in in uh, the world, they're very ego centered. But there's no humility. There's no desire to serve other people. Right. Um, so it's all about them, and that's it. It's yeah, just it's all, all about, about them. them. They're yeah. totally maniacal. Yeah. It's all about them. But then, if you look at some of the greatest like philosophers, mm. you know, or humanitarian, it's like, well, they're they're very other oriented, and it's not about them. It's like, mm. oh, it's not me. I'm right. not this this person. And yet, Jesus is like, no, it is about me. I'm totally the king. And yet, this radical other orientedness yes. of constantly caring for other people, of mm. constantly putting, and uh, again, in any other person you get one or the other. Yeah. He's the only one where both those things come together in a mm. way that's actually compelling. And he's really the only one that can occupy that 
shorter space and hold both of those things together perfectly. Like, um, not only the only ex example, but like truly, he's kind of the only one that have a right to <laughs> say, no, I really am um, the one sent by God. It, you know, there is something unique that is about, you know, me can only be said about me. And yet, yeah, so, so other oriented and everything. And yeah, I had never really picked that up before, but I think you're right. Like you, you can't, um, you know, the kingdom of God, like really did sort of hinge on the king yeah. of Jesus. I mean, it wasn't just, yeah, new principles right. of living or something. Hmm, that's good. Yeah, so he kind of forces us to to contend with that, mm. um, which I do think confronts, as you said earlier, it confronts our kingdoms, but in a different way. Yeah. Not in just kind of the um, political activism way, but truly in a, in a deeper heart way mm -hmm. of, do I want him to be king? Yeah, right. <laughs> Am I willing to let go of my kingdom and yeah. my control to allow him to be king. Mm. Um, and that is a tension that we see in, as the as the narrative moves forward. There is this growing tension. There are those who follow him and are excited. There are others who are not very plussed mm. that he shows up. And yeah. so there's this prompting, I think, in Mark's gospel to get us to wrestle personally mm. with how do we react to him yes. as king. So I think it's just another reason for kind of the urgency and the immediacy that we find mm. in the narrative. So what are some of the priorities that we see uh, Jesus having mm. in just these opening verses? This is something we've talked about as a staff, mm -hmm. but I, I'd love to revisit that conversation here for the podcast. Yeah. When we look at Jesus in just these opening episodes, what do we begin to see about his priorities, mm. what he puts as first and foremost? Yeah, and reflecting on this, like you said, uh, for another time, I think um, the, two, the two words that come to mind are relationships and restoration. And I feel like a lot of our discussions have revolved around those two things, that Jesus is really prioritizing relationships uh, with calling his first disciples, with uh, healing many, but like healing, you know, Simon, this this new disciple that he has, healing his mother-in-law, uh, but just the interacting with people. And his ministry, is that's where it kind of takes place at sort of that the, way down to the, the ground level of, of people and all the healing and interactions he has. So the, all those relationships, um, but then also the restoration that he brings everywhere he goes, uh, whether it is with those, the unclean spirit or with physical diseases. I really think we see um, kind of the nature of Jesus' work, God's kingdom, that where Jesus is working or where Jesus is speaking, where Jesus is active, things are getting restored. And uh, that's what he really prioritizes his time and energy. Yeah. 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 I love how, you know, and I think this is something that, again, as modern people, we, we miss um, every action that Jesus does, whether it's his teaching or his healing or the casting out of demons. We tend to look at those and be like, oh, well, he's just proving that he's, you know, the son of God. Like, but, you know, you could do any number of things that would have been cool and would have shown that you had a lot of power. Like yes. Jesus could have been like fireworks and magically there were fireworks. Mm -hmm. But what we see him doing is using his power and using his authority to actually, as you said so well, restore people, mm -hmm. store, restore his creation. Yeah. And in many ways, his miracles and his teachings are all saying, this is what life in the kingdom of God looks like. Mm. It's a place where there's spiritual freedom. Yeah. There's a place where there's light and not darkness. Mm. It's a place where there's healing and wholeness is given. Um, it's a place where there's a king, yeah. <laughs> a king who teaches us his ways mm. and invites us into relationship and calls us to follow him. So this idea that every action of Jesus is really illustrating for us, this is what life in the kingdom is all about. So each one tells a story, tells a message. Yeah. And then to your point about relationships, I mean, the other relationship we see early on here is that he, he takes time apart to be with his father too. We mm. get, there's, I mean, it's, it, Mark starts with a bang. He's going here and doing this and yeah. calling people and healing and casting out demons. But then you get this little beautiful aside in verses 35 to 39 where he goes out and he just talks to his father. Mm. He spends time with him in prayer. And that's a pattern that we see of Jesus too, is he's not enamored with the crowds. He... He's wholly enamored with his father, what his father's called him to do, mm. following that leading and direction, taking that time. And even when the disciples come out, they're like, hey, everybody's looking for you. Almost like, hey, ministry's happening over here. Let's go back. He's like, 
no, let's keep moving forward. My yeah. father's called me to a mission. Hmm. And he never lets the urgency of the ministry get in the way of that time with God, with his, hmm. with his father, which I, as somebody who works in ministry, find is a super important reminder. Yes, um, a challenging reminder. A <laughs> yeah. challenging reminder, but a, but a very important one yeah. of like prioritizing that time uh, to just be with God mm -hmm. rather than just doing things for God. Yeah. And I think that's something that I think every Christian needs to be reminded of. We're invited into that relationship too. Yes. Well, and, and like you mentioned with the, his relation, Jesus' relationship with his father, uh, of course, you know, at Trinity, if you are around for any amount of time, you'll maybe hear us talking about those three key relationships of with God and with other believers, but then with those who are, are not believers, having those three kinds of relationships uh, always in your life, you know, that's uh, kind of the, the model that Jesus sets for us. And so the fact that it comes again so early for us that this kind of, uh, this pattern, this example of prioritizing not just relationships in general, but these three kinds of relationships is, you know, something that we pay uh, very close attention to and we're constantly trying to um, sort of follow Jesus' um, example there. Yeah. So to kind of wrap up this section, um, the, the central question of mm. Mark's gospel is always, what kind of king is Jesus? Mm. So if all we had was Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 39, mm. how would you answer that question? Hmm. I think Jesus is the kind of king that, on the one hand, is very approachable, because a lot of people do approach him. Um, and he is humble, and yet he's also powerful and uh, unique in that there's really no one who could be both that humble and that that powerful in such a kind of a perfect a perfect way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the kind of king I'm I'm picking up so far. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? I I would probably steal a word you used a little bit earlier. He's he's a restoring king. Mm. You know, he he comes in power, but he uses it to restore. Mm. I think it it brings together those two sides of him, right? Just that incredible authority, which is a word that gets repeated a couple times in these opening verses, but yeah. also that incredible desire to serve mm. um, and to heal and to restore. Mm. So we see we already see here. Uh, not, certainly, this isn't the only place in Mark, but we already see just in these opening episodes, he's a restoring king. Yeah. That's what he came to do. Hmm. So Well said. Yeah. Well, looking forward to next uh, episode. We'll get in and we'll start to continue to expand hmm. uh, on that question. Yeah. Um, but Paul, thanks for joining me for this episode. It's been great. No, yeah. Love this gospel. Yep. And for the rest of you, uh, please stay tuned both for the messages on the weekend as well as for our midweek episodes as we continue through the Gospel of Mark in our series, Walking with the King. Thank you so much for joining us on the Trinity Podcast. We hope this week's message encouraged you to consider the claims of Jesus in a new way, and we would love to have you join us for worship on the weekend. To find a location near you, visit www.tlc4u.org.